Hi, Richard J. Hello. How are you? Where are you? I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Right, and I'm in Miami Beach, Florida. So it's hot there. Yeah, and the cases are spiking and it's nerve wracking, the whole situation. But I won't complain because I'm not packed into an apartment in a high rise in New York, so I'm all right. Your governor is uh, a real peach, isn't he? Yeah, he's uh, a peach wouldn't begin to describe it. But let's get off that topic and get on to topic. Yeah. I'll, I'll rev out. I'll totally rev out. So, um, first of all, I'm flattered that you wanted to have me on the show. You just went through before we started who you'd had on and stuff. So, uh, I hope I deliver the goods. You, please. It is. It was a real honor to have you. I, you know, I've been a big fan of your work and wow. separate and apart from who you have worked for and the work, you know, uh, I've, I've admired you as being someone who is very much like me, uh, you know, a theater lover to the core through and through, possibly to an unhealthy degree in my case. So it feels very, yeah. I don't get to, st I don't cross the line to stalker. <laughs> no, and certainly neither do I, but it, it's, I'm joking. you know, I watched an interview um, of yours where you, you gave somebody a tour of your home. Oh, really? You got so verklempt talking about. Real? Oh, I know who that was. That was Lisa Petrillo at CBS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah, because yeah, we're good friends. Because I haven't done a lot of interviews in my home. So yeah, she, uh, yeah, that's when I gave her the Barbara Streisand Christmas ornament. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the year the ornament came out for Broadway Cares Like Equity Fight Saints, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm a purely selfish uh, question. How, uh -huh. how did your love affair for the theater start? It was pretty simple. It was visceral. I was um, very young. I was maybe 14 years old. And uh, my dad, who was an avid churchgoer, we grew up Catholic, and he was a CPA and a teacher. Uh, and he would go help out with the annual musical. This is long before high school musicals were bogus, right? Mm -hmm. And he threw me in the auditorium of the high school of the St. Cecilia Players, and Bye Bye Birdie was on the stage. So the telephone hour happened, you know, and uh, it was a full orchestra in the horn, da 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 da, oh yeah. And, you know, I probably had two hairs on my arm, and they stood up. And I just knew this was what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And so I didn't know anything about this. And I started going to, we had a great library, the Solvay Public Library, and they had cast albums section with the big headphones and the record players. And then my parents joined the Columbia Record Club for me. And that's how I first heard Funny Girl, the stage musical. And I'm like, oh, they left an A out of her name. You know, I was like, you know, I just didn't know anything. And I sort of learned it all backwards. Like I learned my show tunes from Stephen Eady. And then I discovered they were from musicals. You know what I mean? Because we had a lot of music in the house and a lot of Cuban music and Spanish music. And uh, uh, my mother loved Sarah Vaughn. She loved Rosemary Clooney. They loved Johnny Mathis, of course. So, uh, but basically that was it. And I said, when I'm in high school, I'm gonna be in those musicals. And I was. And, you know, it just takes a couple of those teachers, a music teacher, a drama coach. And then I started going downtown and I was in the Me Nobody Knows and, uh, you know, with inner city kids. And, and it just, uh, you know, and then I went off to college and studied music and theater. And, um, you know, I mean, you're actually talking to a guy who a lot of people can't say this, all my dreams came true and more. So uh, it's been icing on a cake for many, many years now. So I'm just waiting to get hit by a bus. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, can you articulate what those dreams were that you had growing up? That well, you didn't know what they were, but like my dad saw my fever for this. I was one of five kids and everybody else was, you know, IBM and doctors and, you know, medical and lawyers and all that. And I was the only one bit by the bug. And so my dad started buying me the Sunday New York Times and I would slavishly look at that arts and leisure section. And I'd be talking, Ma, look, the Andrews sisters are in a musical on Broadway. Anyway, my parents took me to New York for the first time. Like, I have four brothers and sisters, and I got paid so much attention to, so did they, but I don't even remember them. You know what I mean? Like, I got so much attention. Like, my dad was so great. You know, and yesterday was Father's Day, and they're gone now. But anyway, uh, but anyway, we went to New York, and uh, I saw the front of the Winter Garden with Mame, and it was the most glamorous thing I ever saw. I can't remember what hotel we stayed at, but... Um, I said, Dad, I want to see Mame. 
And so he couldn't get tickets. And he, uh, he said, I can get something called George M. And I'm like, I don't want to see George M. I want to see Mame, you know? And I can you imagine like Joel Gray, Bernadette Peters, like I just didn't know anything yet. And so my dad went to a scalper, God bless him. And he got front row mezzanine tickets to Mame. And my tongue was literally hanging out. I just couldn't believe it starting so bleak. St. Bridget deliver us. And it goes up, da, 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 you know, it's today. I mean, I was really messed up in a good way from that and then you know that girl was on at that time on television so i'm looking up at the buildings all i needed was the parasol you know to make the picture complete like this is where i'm gonna live and then we started going on church trips and high school my friends in high school liked theater and so uh you know i would sneak to new york for 17 dollars and 40 cents student standby i could have been stranded in new york you know what i mean if i couldn't get on that last plane but it was a different time but I wouldn't change anything about it, but the library, and they would call me when new musicals came in. And that's how I learned my musicals, my lyrics. I learned my timing from my early drama coaches in high school. Um, and it was pretty good. It was a really different, simple time. And, you know, one thing that I'll never forget, uh, Mark Sendroff uh, handles my career. And um, he was very close to Danny Fortas. And Danny Fortas was in Minnie's Boys when he was 17 years old. Mm. So, uh, I was up watching The Tonight Show with my mom, with Johnny Carson, and I go, Ma, he's my age. And it was all very real that I could get to Broadway. And so I didn't know how, and I grew up in a very, very small town, um, but uh, my dad did everything. He used to drive me to summer stock. It was pretty amazing, you know? So the library for you was where you learned all of- Yeah, I ran down the hill every, I didn't care about anything. My fourth grade teacher, she got a copy of The Music Man. I went to her house to listen. Like everybody shared their stuff. When I was in sixth grade, um, um, that teacher, my English teacher went to see Sweet Charity and I hung on every word. And she's like, it's not appropriate like for your age, but the story is this. And she's a dance hall girl. And I was like, the whole thing was so verboten that I was so excited and I just couldn't get enough. And I read every word of every, you know, there wasn't a lot, but I had, I had um, uh, subscriptions to Q Magazine, Show Magazine. That's where I knew about Barbara and the International Hotel. I really, you know, uh, uh, Blythe Danner, when she burst on the scene, Butterflies Are Free. I was like, uh, you know, it was starting to like infect me. I knew everything about Off-Broadway, which nobody knew anything about. And that was happening and it was the middle of the sexual revolution and lots of, you know, don't bother me, I can't cope, and all those kinds of shows, and um, uh, uh, your arms too short to box with God, and all those, and so I really got, you know, but I saw those, like Craig Burns, you know, the casting director, mm -hmm. he's like the biggest lame Miss fan in the world, one of my better friends, and um, when I take him to my storage, he goes berserk, but the last time, I, I actually broke into a fever, because I have 50 years of theater going in New York City, uh, of playbills and I clipped the ticket to them so I can tell you when I saw them what I paid standing room you know like the year I moved to New York 1975 uh, Chicago and Chorus Line were on and I had a six dollar seat to Chorus Line the very last seat up on the left in the back but it didn't matter I may as well have been in the front row like I was delirious you know and knew every word of the cast album I'd lived in San Francisco the year before before moving to New York um, so uh, it's really interesting like Today, there are so many theater schools and training programs and stuff. And I always say when I do speak or lecture or master class, it doesn't matter where you go to school, it's what you do with your education. But people, when they ask for advice, there's no shortcuts, there's a lot of YouTube, there's a lot of contests, there's all kinds of stuff. If somebody wants it, I honestly believe they'll get it. You know, they may not get what they ultimately want, but they'll chase it and they'll get there. There is no easy way. You know, it's a whole different world. So I have no advice. I think it was Jennifer Lewis who said, the elevator to success is broken. Take the damn stairs. Oh, yeah. And that's good. I love her. It's amazing. Um, you know, I, I, so that was, you know, Julie James was that for me. I mean, I skipped... 90% of high school and just drove around in my car. Because it came free with the car, right? No, my parents actually bought it. They, oh, they, they bought, bought it? Okay, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just, I could I'm not. I'm addicted to Sirius like some myself. The whole, a couple of the Barbara summers when we were rehearsing for a whole summer to and from Malibu from West Hollywood every day, they were my companions, Seth and Christine yeah. and 
and John Tartaglia and Julie. And I wrote her like a fan letter, you know, just going, God, you know, you know so much. And, and that's how we became friends. You know, I just wrote her like privately, but they were my companions for an entire couple of summers of work because they were my, my hookup while I was out of the mix to, uh, to Broadway and my friends and what they were doing. And, and also, um, you know, a lot of the Hollywood people and she had a lot of great guests she spoke with. So did Christine, you know? And obviously Seth. Seth. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, I've always wondered this. Um, of course, Line is my mother's favorite musical. Uh -huh. Not um, an actor in any way. But what what is it? I mean, just like you, she can hum and sing all of the lyrics to all of the songs. What do you think it is about that musical? Well, all the musicals that were of their moment, you know, whether you said pick Les Mis or Phantom or Hamilton or Wicked, working backwards, the Oklahomas, the Fiddler on the Roofs, the West Side Stories. You know, if you go to the thrift stores down here, because a lot of retirees, they die and the stuff goes to the Salvation Army or whatever, which is my joy, you know what I mean? But there are so many Fiddler on the Roofs. There are so many Sound of Musics. It's sort of like the first family records with Vaughn Meter. People used to have people over and share these musicals, or they saw it in New York and bought the album at Sam Goody. You know, like sometimes you'll see the actual stamp or whatever, or they have autographs on them because, uh, you know, everybody went to see Camelot because that's what they did. Like when we saw Mad Men all those years, oh, I have two tickets to Guys and Dolls or whatever they were talking about. But it's, uh, it was always the hot ticket. But, you know, Chorus Line was, nobody had ever seen anything like that. You know, and it just broke out. And don't forget, there were no head mics or, that was all, you know, projecting and they had the floor mic, you know, but it was so exciting, you know? And still, if you see a great production, it's still exciting. I work with Byrock Lee a lot and she teaches the, the Chorus Line warm up and stuff. But like just Ed Ciotto, is that his name? Ciotto, do you know him? No, I don't think so. S-C-I-O-T-T-O. -T -T uh, I don't know him either, but he did a video a couple of weeks ago where he's now teaching, you know, he's done Broadway. And he has a husband and two kids and, and the school's locked and blah, blah. And so he gave me somebody to dance for and he did full out. And I was sobbing because like, that's who we are. Like, what do we do? It's not like we're going to go be secretaries tomorrow. So while we're in this pandemic, like this Cats video that just came out yesterday, which is a beautiful compilation, like that was a huge work. And it started with, um, like, you see all these videos that people have worked on, but everybody's going crazy in their apartments or in their backyards or whatever, and everybody just wants to bust out. And when it didn't look like it was going to be this long, I had made my mind up already that I was going to go to Ain't Too Proud, which I love. I'm a huge fan of the show. Like, when Broadway came back, I was going to be there on the first night because I just wanted to see those guys bust out. You know what I mean? And uh, now, who knows when that'll be. And... The biggest heartbreak of all of this is that that original uh, Broadway cast of six, imagine your parents are in town, you're getting your flowers from your friends, and all of a sudden you're not opening. I mean, I can't even, it's worse than being in previews like company or in rehearsal. That was their opening night and no, no possible adjustment was made just to accommodate this extraordinary event with a lot of kids with their Broadway debuts and I got heartbroken. So sometimes I just like cry about it. I mean, my career is in a weird way in the rear view mirror, you know, I'm 67 now and uh, uh, you know, I can work as much or as little as I want, but for the majority of my friends and people that I know and admire and love, they're being cut like right here, you know what I mean? Or watching Kristen, you know, who's busy every single day of the year, you know, watching her go insane. It's wild, you know what I mean? And also just all the outer things and all the agents. And so, and Zooms are nice, but you know, it's, uh, you wonder like, will I ever hug a friend again? Will I be in rehearsal? Will we be able to sing and not worry about spitting? You know, uh, it's, it's, it's just a really, really bizarre thing. And I don't have answers, but even something that I was doing uh, for Lincoln Center, uh, which was scheduled for April, they had postponed till September, and then I got a, a letter over the weekend that now it's going to be a full year later, next April. So I'm okay about it, but a lot of other people that have to pay their rent, and, you know, they really lived the day in and day out of that life, which I lived, you know, all through the 70s and uh, up to the mid-80s. Um, I get it. So um, it's it's 
it's a lot. It's a real lot. And, and then look at everything else that's going on, whether it's politically, whether it's, you know, the Black Lives Matter, uh, which is fantastic. But, you know, I'm also upset that I'm seeing people argue with each other that I love, you know, so that's a hard thing to watch. But change is coming. I really believe that. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't see myself. I don't know what the answer is. You know, like I thought it was going to be Andrew and Cameron <clears throat> teaching us. And, you know, because of the Seoul Korea production of Phantom, then Andy Senior Jr. going to do Rent and uh, Andrew offering his theater to experiment with, you know. But we haven't really had a voice on Broadway speaking and informing us and stuff. And that's a little distressing, like, if I can be honest. It's just really, I've put my whole, you know, my whole career is based on Broadway. Even if you look at all the people I've worked with, the singers and the concert artists and the cabaret people, Everybody that I work with has velocity, has lungs. They're, they're theater oriented. Even Barbara, you know, she's Broadway's greatest export. Do you know what I'm saying? So going back to theatrical roots with her is a joy for me. You know, watching her blow her lungs out in rehearsal. It's fantastic. But everybody I work with pretty much, even Deborah Cox, who we were interrupted uh, by this, you know, she's been on Broadway and she's a singer, singer, but uh, everybody I work with comes with a very unique set of tools and they're, all dare I say as good of singers as they are they're actors who sing and so that puts me in a a whole different situation of possibilities and choices and approaches and investigations you know because I, I have pretty fantastic collaborations I can honestly say they're collaborations and discussions and trying things and uh, you know it's fun I love it it's like playing with play-doh and I don't have all the answers. I don't go in with any lists or anything like that. I have ideas, you know, everybody thinks I'm pretty organized, but um, you know, I'm getting the energy from what's coming at me and that's, I'm sort of making it up as I go along. So how did you get started in the world of concert directing? It's a really happy story. Well, I used to stage girl groups like in the late seventies, early eighties, like modern romance and stuff. And I was going to um, Reno Sweeney all the time when uh, formerly the Harlets had broken away from Bette Midler. And so I saw a lot of stuff going to see Ellen Green, all the theatrics that were on the stage. And uh, saw a lot of great lighting, you know, and a lot of great sound and Desmond Child and Rouge. And um, uh, so I was doing a lot of that. And I sang, you know, a few times and raised money for Broadway Cares. But I used to do a nightclub act when I was in Amadeus. One was called Moonlighting. Another one was called Breaking the Rules. And I don't know where we got the energy. Like, you'd get out of a show at the theater at 1130. You'd go down to Ted Hooks. You'd put on a show. You'd go home at 2. You'd wake up in the morning and go to class. I don't know. I couldn't do it now. But, um, but it was Bernadette Peters that changed my life. It was her. And so we had done song and dance together. And... Um, uh, whatever year it was, um, Arthur Lawrence had asked her to make her solo debut on behalf of Gay Men's Health Crisis, the GMHC. And um, uh, she had appeared at Carnegie Hall many times. You know, anyone can whistle, the Sondheim concert, a lot of things that are, right. um, that are you know, documented. But uh, this was her solo debut, and she said, I'm not going to do it without you. And even her manager at the time, Tom, wasn't sure, because Tom grew up in an era of, you know, Harry Belafonte, Sinatra, these people that could come every year that were recording artists that sold records, and it was a different business. But I called him. I called Tom because I loved him, because he loved me, and he was a real gentleman, and he took a shine to me during Song and Dance. And I discussed it with him. And it was Bernadette that came up with the idea of the second half being all Sondheim. Now, interestingly, she was not interested in doing the Dames at Sea and the visiting, revisiting her career because she was already singing Lyle Lovett. She was doing a lot of different things in her uh, concert work. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know, Bernadette, I'm the wrong guy if that's not if what you want to do because you can't decide who fell in love with you when. And people, I remember hearing about you in 71, uh, you know, off Broadway and Dames at Sea, you know, and that was after they did it at that little cafe and hearing Peter Patter, what's the voices that are so distinctive. It was like hearing Christian Chenoweth the first time in um, Steel Pier. These people are born to be on a stage. There's no question. Sutton Fa These people are so identifiable. You know, the voices are so unique. Gwen Verdon, Cheetah, uh, just ferocious vocal production. So uh, anyway, so she went along with it and, uh, and we had a huge triumph and it was loaded with drama, tons of drama. Like I didn't have anything from her career to end act one with. And so I chose some people and she was nervous about it. And so we, you know, I'm not gonna say we argued or fought, but it was tense. 
And basically I needed something to close act one. And her fear was coming from the fact that uh, she wanted to play that role someday because she had been Dainty June, you know, on the tours. And what if people thought she wasn't? I go, wow, what if she wasn't right for? And I said, I just don't live at that address. Like, you know, this is when I started to come up with these Richard J-isms that actually just came out of my mouth. It was, wasn't even possible to fail, you know? Mm -hmm. But I understood it because everything, oh, Bernie, that's so cute. Give, give. And it was time to take, you know, and get that strut and end it. Well, they can stay and rot da, 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 and coming back to that, but not a rose. And the people went wild. Sure. Things like, um, things like uh, being alive, I didn't want to do it, you know, because Betty had done it and uh, Patty had done it. Uh, maybe Betty didn't do it, Patty. A lot of people had done it. But I said, you know, everybody's Sturm and dronging it and nobody's, you know, and I saw company a number of times when I was in high school and he's begging to feel, you know, Bobby blow out the candles and make a wish, want something, somebody hold me too close, but bring it. So when we met with um, uh, the orchestrator, Michael uh, uh, Starobin, right? I said, put air under her wings, but alone is alone, not alone. And she begged for it and was smiling through it. And we got a standing ovation. It wasn't even the closing number, but it was the approach. And Steve wanted to come to the rehearsal in the afternoon. I said to Bernadette, what do you think? I said, I just don't want him getting in your head. I love Steve. I've done putting it together, but we were doing the wolf. We were doing, you know, uh, Henrik River, you know, we were doing stuff. And so I didn't want anybody messing with her head. Bernadette is a very diligent, hard worker. It's complicated in the best possible way, but I didn't want interference. So anyway, it was the right decision, but I remember there were pay phones then and I'd call Arthur. Arthur, is it get it and get my kids out too or get it and get my kids out? And he goes, get it and get my kids out and thank you for asking. <laughs> it was like, it was just fantastical, you know what I mean? And um, so, and then they wanted to review it for the New York Times and it was one night only. So that was a big discussion. And we decided, let's do it. Who are we doing this for, you know? And then the record deal came. You know, one night, that's it. You got to capture it, one night. So there was a lot. So if you listen to Being Alive, bee, you know, and she cracks her, but I wasn't going to touch it. I wasn't going to dot it in nothing because that performance is so good. And she was in brilliant voice and it, it changed my life that night. Like everything changed, everything. Uh, long before they started calling me the diva whisper, like all that stuff. And, uh, and everybody started calling me like everybody. And, um, you know, the other big change was when Polly Bergen at age 70, Judy Katz called me and said, would you meet with Polly Bergen? She's going to come back to New York and sing. And I'm like, Polly Bergen, isn't she dead? Like she'd been out of town for like a long time. She dropped out. So I had lunch with her and uh, she was gorgeous. Such a handsome woman in that Julie Andrews kind of vein. And, um, and she goes, I'm thinking about doing an evening of love songs. And I'm like, why are you in love? And she goes, oh, you're a smart ass. And I go, yeah, and you're abroad. And tomorrow at the piano, if you're a good singer, I'm in. And so it was stuff like that. You know, and then the other part comes from the Joe Falcons of the world or the Mary, you know, the musical portion, the Joseph Schubert, all these genius people that I get to learn from and we get to work with somebody. But, you know, when you're working with the right people, and I've made choices not to work with people because they're just either the wrong people or, you know, there's too much stuff. Even with Kristen, when she offered me the job, uh, and we did a show and tell the first day together of, you know, what have you been doing on the road, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so she did a Jerome Kern medley, which was quite nice, but there was no payoff. Like, where's all the things you are? One of the greatest songs, if not the greatest song, most perfect song ever written. Yeah. So she's like, but the people love it. And I'm like, yeah, they've loved her for 15 years. What am I doing here? You know? And it's those kinds of moments, but it's not a, that's not a negative exchange. It's a, this is it. We're going to get on the same page and how are we going to do it? Because if we're going to do it, we're going to agree. And then everybody gets cold feet. It happens to almost everybody at one point. And I feel like Stephen Sondheim's lyric, don't leave me halfway through the wood. We're in this together. Let me put this in front of an audience. I need rehearsal too. I need rehearsal. You know, but I'm going to be the first one to know, trust me. The advantage to having somebody like me aboard or along with you or partnering with you is that I see everything. You know, I do my homework. I listen to everything. I sort of know what's going on. I don't pretend to know everything, but I know when something's not truthful. I know when it's like, let's take that window at Lincoln Center. Everybody's like, oh, that view. I'm like, really? Is that all you got? And I want to throw tomatoes. 
like when I used it for Kristen and she came out, we put her in the coat and the suitcase for the, uh, uh, the Dames of Broadway album. You know, Mary Mitchell was, come on along and listen to the lullaby on the piano. Broadway. And Kristen's walking in, she's just looking at New York, right? And then turns around to the audience and goes, too much? You know, and I had the audience because she's a musical theater performer, just like when I've done these late, you know, she's like, I want to open with I'm a woman. I can't do it. I can't do it. How am I going to land a Broadway star? Then I can do the song. And right. Kristen goes, everybody goes along, but it's, uh, it's those sorts of things. Or, or when we did um, uh, the other one and it was called my love letter to Broadway. And there were a lot of show tunes on the list. I'm like, I'm sorry, this is the wrong assignment. So we wrote that letter, dear Mr. Niederlander, I am writing this to you. You know, you made me love you. And the whole thing, and it, but it all comes from the artist, all of it. So when Kristen told me a story once, she listened to Phantom of the Opera and she saw a picture. She goes, wow, she sounds like me and she works. It's that simple. And if you're truthful and you're not talking about the view, you know, or that, or like Norm Lewis, when we had him there, you know, he goes, now I've been sitting out there, you know, like all of you are tonight and I know what's going on out there, but I need your attention right here. It's a way to deal with the window, right. but not talking about that's some view. Yeah, we know it's been here for a billion years. Right. Now that may sound tacky, but it's simple, but you've got to find an original way to deal with it. You know what I mean? And humor is always good for unarming your audience because they know they're going to get a good show. They know you're a good singer. They fell in love with you on Broadway. It's where are we going to take them? You know what I mean? And so that's the challenge. And, you know, even with Barbara, when you're dealing with just tons of albums and tons of hits, it's just narrowing it down to what's going on, you know? And, um, and we've been so, so, you know, I've been with Barbara for, it'll be 20 years this fall. So that's pretty amazing. And, you know, in, in your memories on Facebook, I'm looking, you know, we traveled the world. And right. last year at this time, we were in London for the Hyde Park. It's extraordinary, you know? So it's, and I love it. I still love it. Is it hard? Oh, yeah. And it doesn't matter whether it's a little cabaret show with just a piano or a big monstrous, you know, thing. It, the same stuff goes into it. And you could always be wrong. But my instincts... Uh, I have to trust them. And if the actor or the singer goes along with me and will commit, we can really try it. You know what I mean? Like Bernadette, you know, she nailed that some people. And I was so happy when the New York Times, I didn't go like, yeah, 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 I was right. But when the New York Times said it was that night she got offered Gypsy by Stephen and Arthur, I was just so proud because right. it was a fear. Fear is crippling. Fear is not healthy. And so part of a good director's job is to understand, and I used to be a performer and an actor, and I don't think it makes me any particularly gifted at this, but you gotta pick up the signs. It's not about winning or whose idea is better. Like Barbara and I always say, it doesn't matter where the idea comes from. Execution is everything, you know what I mean? And we make it all a safe room. It's always a safe room. No idea is a bad idea. You have an exchange, you talk, until it's a bad idea, you know what I mean? Or until it doesn't work. But believe me, I know fast, you know, even with Bette Midler, like, you know, and everybody's so different. You know, Bette's got a rat-tat-tat delivery. Bernadette's got a Queen's cadence. Barbara's Brooklyn. It's very interesting. And you also write for cadence, you know, when you're writing with people, with your team or alone. And, uh, and so I've learned to write, you know, I learned to write for Norm. I know how to write for Norm. I know how to write for, you know, uh, it, it's just interesting. It's really interesting. And I'm still fascinated and I still listen to stuff or tables, listen to the mamas and papas. And I just, every day there's some sort of morning music going on here. So, uh, you know, you, you grew up with posters of Barbara on your wall and now you're <laughs> with her. How do you know that? Did you see my bedroom? You, yeah. The one, the famous one is the forum, you know, cause it was big <laughs> and it was the line drawing, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was hard to pull that down after my dad passed away and they were selling the house. It was like glued to the wall. Well, so what was it like, you know, when you got to work with her in, in, in the director's capacity? What was that well, like? Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, you're in awe and you have admiration, but you don't want to be the best friend because you have to be effective. But as early as uh, 85, when I met Bernadette, who I loved, and I went to see a Water Tower place when I was in Chicago with the musical Nefertiti, which closed out of town. Um, uh, I just, you keep to yourself and you do your job, you know what I mean? And then she came around and talked to me because we were doing that workshop. It was very private with Richard Maltby. 
and stuff. And, um, you know, I remember when I first met Barbara, I was in Amadeus as an actor and Amy Irving was in it and Amy got Yentl and uh, Barbara was coming with uh, Sis Corman and we all went to Orso. Amy invited me and said, can I bring my friend Richard, you know? And she's the first, you know, I don't think I said a word. Like I was like, fast forward um, to, you know, 1993 and it was Jay Landers who was her A&R guy who I was friends with. We did the Five Guys Named Mo cast album together at Columbia. And he said, you gotta meet this guy. So Marty flew to New York, he betted me. He said, you gotta meet this kid. And I go to the house, to the apartment. And I got out like four blocks early because I was so nervous. My palms were sweating and my whole office knew I was gone. And I knock on the door and the housekeeper lets me in and nobody's there. Like the manager's not there. Everybody was supposed to meet me there. And Barbara comes barreling down the stairs like, hi, I'm Barbara. And I was like, okay, Richard, it's now or never. And I go, okay, hi, no kidding. And it was, you know, and that night she just happened to be coming to see Putting It Together. And Liza was coming that night, as was Amy Irving. And of course, Julie Andrews was in the show. So I took care of all the girls and put Barbara in her car. And then it was from 93, because we were, at the time, we were discussing doing a TV special. She was going to come back and do a television special for television. It didn't happen. Then a year later, she came out and did the Vegas show. I paid $1,000. Like, everybody flew to Vegas, cried, you know, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't believe I was in the same room with the voice. And then in 2000, uh, I was in Provincetown with Mark Sendroff and uh, Robert Richards and Bob Mackey and a bunch of people and Richie Ridge and Preston. And I got a phone call, are you available to work with Barbara? And I'm like, gee, uh, I think so, you know? Um, and so um, I took over Timeless and, you know, and then as continued tours, don't forget for Bet, I replaced um, uh, Chris Ashley. Like I was the replacement because other people, I guess, had stronger resumes, but then somebody's got to deliver the show. And so I was sort of known for that, you know, getting the horse to the gate. So, uh, and every time a tour came up, you know, there's always a possibility it wouldn't be me, but I'm happy to say that it has been me. And uh, it's been the, one of the joys of my life. And it just strengthens, you know, the lessons I've learned from Barbara are extraordinary, but um, uh, no two people are the same, yet the process is always similar. And working with one helps you, you know, insight into it, you know, and you just always, and I'm pretty uh, immediate, like there's no delay with me ever, which I think everybody appreciates, you know, the honesty, good, bad, or indifferent. But, um, you know, I know my stuff, I know my music, I feel yeah. confident, but not, you know, I'm not cocky about it, but you know what you know, which is why you hire people. Right. Um, what are the moments, uh, you know, that continue to take your breath away? Uh, you mean specifics or just in general? Specifics. Well, <laughs> With Barbara the first time, uh, I'll never forget, because I asked her one day, I said, what does it feel like to hold those notes, you know, for so long? She goes, I don't know, I just do it because I want to. So that night at Madison Square Garden, not that night, but maybe, maybe a week later, because we did L.A. and the garden, and she goes, hey, Mr. Art, Mr. Art, uh, look at me, world, here I am. Now she's supposed to be out, but the voice keeps going, and Bill's like this with the, I am. That was for you, Richard. I'll march. And I had new Gucci boots on, I'll never forget. And I stomped them into the floor at the garden. Uh, Bette Midler, when we opened in Chicago, the Kiss My Brass tour, I was back on the near the sound booth on one of the road trunks watching with a live audience. It was our first audience. And she sang Skylark with just a piano. We had a big splashy orchestra. And I was sobbing, you know, just remembering the Divine Miss M album, you know, when I was a freshman in college. These are the moments where you realize what it is that's happening now. Just now at 67, I'm starting to understand my own career because when you're chasing it or living it. Um, but you know, like I was walking in Miami one day and the phone rings. Hi, is this Richard J? Yeah. Who's this? This is Bette Midler. Who is this really? It's Bette Midler. I'm just, it was crazy. Or Donny Osmond, I'm driving. He goes, hi, it's Donny Osmond. I'm like, come on. And I don't ask where they got my number, you know, but I went to Vegas and I did the Donnie and Marie show, you know? Um, 
it's it's just extraordinary. You know what I mean? Working with Ricky Martin, you know, uh, taking him to Desmond Child, doing the Rainforest and that Carnegie Hall debut. I've got yeah. the world on a string. They're just it's been one thing after another. You know, Kristen Chenoweth and all the people that adore her or putting her into the Hollywood Bowl Hall of Fame with the Go Go's and Pink Martini. Mm-hmm. And I've been all over the world you know and it's just it's crazy and so broadway is a huge chapter particularly the macintosh years uh but leah salonga's uh carnegie hall debut brian stokes mitchell's carnegie hall debut these things are unbelievable you know and at that time leah we were announcing she was at the end of her first trimester have you ever seen that footage on youtube i don't think so so anyway she told she was in the philippines i was in new york and she's like you know, Richard, I'm pregnant. I'm like, wow, would you ever be willing to tell the audience? Well, you know, I'll be just at the end of the first trimester because, you know, it's bad luck. But I thought, you know, I've been listening to that song, The Story Goes On in Auditions for a long, long time. What if it was real? And then, of course, she and Liz had a relationship because they were both in Miss Saigon. And Liz was pregnant during Miss Saigon, but made it to the stage for the first preview. And now her child was grown up. So Leia had never heard the song Married from Cabaret or wasn't familiar with it from the stage show. So we told this whole story and you can see it on YouTube. It's so gorgeous. So the world can change. It can, with just one little word, Mary. And she starts to tell the story of marrying Rob and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, you know, and ever since we got married, it's like, Leah, when are you going to have a baby? You know what I mean? Oh, you know, no rush. Well, that used to be my stock answer, but that can no longer be my answer because ladies and gentlemen, you are all looking at a very happy pregnant girl at the end of her first trimester. And Kevin Stites in the da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da. And I got permission from Malpy and Shire that came to my rehearsal to sing the horn sections, you know, the dun, 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 dun. So Leia's singing it, the audience is sobbing, and then right in the big change, right down, 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 the door opens and Liz comes out. And all these things I feel and more, my mother's. So we get to this and we get to the drama part and she looks at Leia and goes, your child is next. And Leia's like, you know, it was thrilling. Any idea that Liz was gonna be there? Yes, we planned it all. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the thing is when you do a Carnegie Hall and you're there for one night, things got to matter it's the stakes got to be high you can't just be screaming about nothing and a lot of people do scream about nothing but i i'm not into that that game and uh so like stokes you know i had reba mcintyre and the theme that happened was because i had uh, headley heather headley i had reba mcintyre who had been a broadway replacement and you get your gun heather replaced in ragtime um who else was in the show uh oh felicia rashad was a replacement in um uh um what was the musical um, uh, that uh, Stokes replaced Gregory Hines in? Uh, anyway, so it was all understudies and replacements, right? So Reba and Stokes had done South Pacific, but he had never done anything from Annie Get Your Gun, but she knew it, so I did that, you know? Mm-hmm. And that was a moment, I remember Stokes at intermission summoning me to his, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know, I don't know if this is our crowd. I don't know, like Stokes, you're Brian Stokes Mitchell, I'm nobody, do whatever the hell you want. And because I had him doing a costume change, it was a joke on stage where he gets into cowboy boots, right? For this thing, right? And he's got his tuxedo on. So Reba and I are looking at the TV. Is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? So I have no idea. But it's just, uh, you know, and everybody gets freaked out, you know? Um, but I'm there to be calm and, uh, you know, I feel like the work is solid and now we just got to deliver it. But I get it. I totally get it. You know, I don't get upset or mad or anything. <clears throat> I hope. And then when it works, I have a big smile on my face uh, of joy, not like I told you so. So, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough gig, but it's glorious. And also I had Paul Gemignani uh, for Stokes. And so I, that was the first time I'd ever worked with him. And I, we both said to each other, we were both nervous about working together. Like, would we get along? Would we like each other? Because we'd heard about each other. And it was just a match made in heaven. And we haven't worked together since, but we adore each other. You know, we're working with Jonathan Tunick on the Rodgers and Hammerstein album. You know, when I told him what I wanted to do with Nothing Like a Dame, because I needed something to replace Broadway Baby. Oh, you want horns? I do strings. I go, Jonathan, I can't record anything. I can't stage. This is what I need. It ended up being one of his favorite orchestrations. You know, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's like that. But how fantastic to spar with other genius people, you know, and I always wanted to do one of those albums that you arranged and conducted by like Don Costa with Steven Eady and stuff. And I didn't have one. 
And uh, Jonathan Tunick was the guy arranged and conducted by with Bernadette Peters Loves Rogers and Hammerstein. And even Bernadette, why not Gershwin? Because it's been done. Why not Rogers and Hart? Because it's been done. You know, Tower Records was open, then I could look at everything. And uh, and nobody had done a uh, Rogers and Hammerstein record since Sinatra in the 50s. So and we opened a Radio City Music Hall. And, you know, there was a case where I gave Jonathan Tunick half of my fee as producer to get five extra songs so that I could play Radio City Music Hall and start a tour. So it was just thinking like that, you know, there was always a little bit of whoredom in me, you know, of, you know, and, uh, and that was a beautiful show and, and Bernadette singing those songs. Then 9-11 happened in the middle of that recording. So you'll never walk alone, really, you know, and uh, I remember her under her breath walking out of the hit factory or wherever we were. And she's like, that song's not going to be on the album. You know, just, you know, she was having her night. I was having my night. And I'm like, oh, anyway, it turned out to be beautiful. But these things happen. It's not mean. It's not terrible. It's just part of the process. You know what I mean? It's like Betty Buckley. She couldn't believe how quick I could do a running order because she pains herself, you know, for two weeks. It's just not what I do. You know what I'm saying? Like, how how could you do that so fast? You know what I mean? Um. So... I, I, uh, Les Mis is my favorite musical of all time. If there's oh, wow. one I can sing start to finish. Oh, wow. It is that one. So At the I, end of the day, you're another day older. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. And that's all you can say for the life of the poor. So if you could describe your experience with Les Mis in three words, what would you say? Uh, never again duplicated. Okay. That was a pretty amazing 10 years and, uh, you know, living on planes, lots of companies, but, you know, and also the middle of the AIDS crisis, you know, the heat of it all and AZT and singers on these, you know, just so much stuff comes to mind. Um, but also while Limis was happening, you know, we had Phantom, we had Saigon. It was a lot of simultaneous stuff going on, but the thing about Les Mis, because I actually, you know, was the associate director and executive producer, but for all intents and purposes, I staged all the productions in North America and sort of beyond. And um, uh, those friendships, like we just lost to Gavroche, the friendships are extraordinary. And you had marriages, divorces, deaths, you know, babies, um, just extraordinary period of time and wildly successful, which made it, easier to go find people. So I could go to Branson, Missouri. I could go to Las Vegas. I could go to Orlando. You know, I brought people to New York from all over the place. Um, um, what's her name? Um, oh God. Um, Michael Berry's wife, um, the wonderful singer. She was in Beauty and the Beast. She was in Les Mis as Eponine. She was uh, in uh, Light in the Piazza. Um, oh my God, what's her name? I see her every night singing on her porch. I have no idea. Anyway, uh, oh God, why can't I remember her name? I love her so much. <clears throat> anyway, she was in the chorus of a production of Cabaret that I went to see Sam Harrison at um, uh, that theater in, uh, in Sacram Sacramento Music Circus. And I just looked at her and I went, oh my God, she's Eponine. She was a dancer in the chorus. Mm -hmm. And I sent her to Jim May and, um, uh, and that's it. And she came to New York and then I brought her boyfriend and uh, it was like, you know, Scott Wise's daughter, you know, I hired her to play Cosette. You save money for college, Andrew McArdle's daughter. You could do these things. I mean, you didn't gift it. They had to be able to sing and perform and all of that. Yes. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah uh, Uriarty, Sarah Uriarty Berry. Yeah. So anyway, and look at her career and look at her and she's singing on the porch now during the pandemic and I write her on Facebook. These are my Fam like kids, family, you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's unbelievable. When Gary Beach passed away, wow. unbelievable. He opened two companies for me, Los Angeles and San Francisco. We were all in the earthquake and just so many fantastic things. And, you know, Hal Prince, um, I think it was Stephen Sondheim. I can't remember who it was that at the memorial service said that Hal made a statement once, I'm sorry, nobody else will ever have my career. And his career is unlike any, you know, certainly mine can't touch it, but no one will ever have a career like I had either. You know what I mean? And so, um, um, you know, the things I've gotten to do, the things I've seen, the things I've experienced, it's, it's quite extraordinary. And I'm really, really grateful, you know, um, and it wasn't easy, you know, but, um, uh, 
it's uh, I did it. Like I really did it. I came from a town this big. <laughs> well, if you could say anything to childhood Richard J, what would you say to him? Uh, and just nothing because it's like I said, you, I knew I was going to go to New York. Like I just knew it. Nothing was going to stop me. Mm-hmm. And as a matter of fact, <clears throat> you know, my dad who was a wonderful guide, uh, not shortly after I moved to New York, I got the International Tour of Godspell to play Jesus for $1,000 a week. That was a lot in 1975. And uh, I called my, you know, because we had answering services. The service called me and I got a job. And so I woke up my parents and, and my dad was silent. And I grew up as Dickie. So whenever my dad wanted to say something serious, I was Richard. And I go, dad, what's wrong? And he goes, what did you go to New York to do? And I go to be on Broadway. He goes, okay. So you go away for a year. You come back with $52,000. And another graduating class shows up in New York. And you've wasted a year of meeting people. There were no words like networking back then or anything. Um, no trendy little clever phrases. And, um, and, you know, I really cared what my dad thought. Not in terms of pleasing, but he had been so guiding to me with college and all this stuff. Um, and... Uh, it killed me. It killed my ego to turn that down. Jesus and Godspell, 1975. You couldn't have a better job. And I turned it down. And six weeks later, I had my first Broadway show, Zoot Suit, at the Winter Garden, where, I, where I'd seen Mame uh, and where Barbara did Funny Girl. <laughs> I mean, so you can't even imagine the puzzle. Or if you'd told me that I was going to produce and direct, I remember um, the turning point was Amadeus. You know, I was in the original Broadway cast. And I was a ballet and an understudy, and my friend said, take the second ASM contract. It pays an extra $35 a week. You collect valuables, but you get to go to all the understudy rehearsals, learn everything you can, and then try to direct the tours. And that's what I did. And that was a very good advice from a company manager that I'd worked with on Porgy and Bess, the one that won the Tony in 77, and uh, Nefertiti, a guy named Mario De Maria. And uh, when it came time for the tours, I went and met with Liz and Nell, Liz uh, McCann and Nell Nugent. And I said, do you think that William Morris and the National Theater of Great Britain and Sir Peter Hall and Peter Sheffer would ever approve me? And they did. And that was the beginning. And the Schuberts, they were so kind to me. Like, you know, Bernie, Jerry, all these people were a huge part of my career in decision making. So there I am, a matinee eating at Sardi's because that's where you ate on the actor's menu. And there's Tommy Toon. He was doing my one and only. I said, Tommy, I got the directing job, but I'm an actor. Like, I'm so confused. He goes, Richard J. He goes, after I wanted Tony for Seesaw, I couldn't get arrested until I did the club. You got to understand when a window opens. It, this was not when one door closes. That phrase wasn't around yet either. Another one opens. It was a window back then. And I took Tommy Toon's advice. And we're friends to this day. And, uh, and you just don't forget those stories. And we didn't know each other well. But, you know, I remember reading in Vanity Fair that he was a millionaire from theater and, you know, like just, you know, he, and he was somebody I looked up to, like what could be achieved. And, um, and he was just a very nice to me, always very kind. We have time for one more question. Oh, okay. Um, everyone. So I'm going to ask you, if you could invite five people to dinner, who would you invite? Dead or alive? Yes. Oh, dead or alive. Um, ooh. Uh, oh, wow. I would probably invite, um, um, oh, what's her name? Um, uh, wonderful actress from the goddess actor studio. Um, she played, uh, oh my gosh, what's her name? Kim Stanley. I would love Kim Stanley. Uh, I probably would invite Peter Schaffer. I would probably invite um, Stephen Sondheim. I would definitely have Barbara there. And the fifth one would be, oh, you know who it would be? It's pretty easy. Hmm. Uh, it would be Jay Landers. Wow. Yeah, it's a, that would be a really, really nice mix. And Jay, you know, when we met, his adoration for theater, because he was a Columbia, you know, he took me to Disney for projects and stuff. But he, you know, he was a New Yorker for a lot of years, and his dad was a legend. And uh, he's so smart. And uh, I don't know, we've been friends for almost 30 years. It's sort of crazy. All from recording a cast album of Five Guys Named Mo. Wow. Well, thank you so much for being Really? Is that interesting at all? I don't even know what I said. Are you kidding me? 
<laughs> this sounds interesting. I want. I just want to keep talking for hours.